we have seen from previous um, presentations already as we've gone through the 10 keys uh, that Revelation has. Actually, there's a few more, but um, how because we don't apply these keys, we can come up with some pretty interesting interpretations of the book of Revelation, but not just interesting, but also wrong and leading us in different directions than God intended. The symbolic and the major use of the Old Testament is a huge one. And I'm glad that we didn't just cover it every on night, uh, night number one. But if you haven't noticed, every evening we have been using the first two keys. Actually, all the ones that we've covered already, uh, the order structures, and the Christ-centered prophecies, the sanctuary imagery. Uh, we have seen the historical applications. That's what led us to understand who the Antichrist is. Because we saw that prophecy is not just something for the past. And that it's not just something that will begin to tell us things in the future. Prophecy has never stopped giving us insights and applications and warnings throughout human history. And one of the major ones was the development of this Antichrist a power institution that, will incor- that would incorporate Greek theology, Greek mythology into Christian truth, perverting and distorting an image, the image of God. And when I say Greek, like I said last night and in previous occasions, the Greeks themselves had absor- absorbed Egyptian theology, Babylonian teachings, Assyrian religion, and made a big salad of it. And Aristotle and Plato and many others uh, made it very sophisticated and palatable, and the Christian church swallowed it whole. Swallowed it whole. And so all of us Christians have been affected by ideas of reality and interpretations of scripture and reality. But what we're seeing tonight is that the Bible is pretty clear and the confusion comes from that teaching from pagan origins. And as far as the Bible is concerned, all pagans, the book of Psalms tells us, were influenced and inspired by demons, by fallen beings. Those religions, we have good people in those, good humans, but the actual teachings and the theologies that they espouse in paganism uh, were inspired and guided, the Bible says, by demons themselves. Tonight, as we are looking into the second part, we're going to be applying two new keys to uh, the book of Revelation, an interpreted key that is in the book of Revelation called recapitulation. It's a big theological, like I told you, theologians love to make things more complicated. It just means replay. Um, any of you ever watch tennis or um, volleyball or football? Uh, the Super Bowl, um, when there's a questionable call, the referee will go to the sideline, even soccer, they're doing that now too, and uh, the, the ref or one of the refs, I guess in football, they have people up in some booth looking at the video, and they'll play the scene, and then they'll replay it, but not from the same camera, but from another camera. Um, if you've seen any kind of sports lately, a baseball, softball, whatever, we'll stick to American football. Um, you'll see the us at home watching it. You'll see the quarterback throwing it and some guy running and catching it. And then immediately you'll see the, a quarterback throwing the ball again and the same player catching it, but from a totally different perspective. And then you'll see the quarterback throwing it again and someone else catching it and running and making a touchdown. And it wasn't three touchdowns, it was just one, except that we kept seeing the replay. The book of Revelation does the exact same thing. Why? Because God is showing one human being something that he needs to write down, but as he is describing, as God is showing one thing in history that is happening, something else is happening simultaneously. So God has to go back and show uh, John the same time period, but from a different perspective with different symbols. And so theologians have discovered that because if you go to Revelation chapter 6, you see the second coming in Revelation chapter 6. When the, the rich men, the wealthy men, the kings and the powerful, all the freed men and all the slaves are telling the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who the, the sky has rolled apart like a scroll and they're seeing the glory of God and they're telling the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of, the, of God and of the face of the, the lamb for the day of his uh, wrath has come and who is able to stand. That's the second coming. But it's in Revelation chapter six. Then you have a whole bunch of other things happening which of course are not going to happen after the second coming, all that is happening is now that now that we've been given this view, 
now the Bible is going to go back in time and give us another perspective some, of some other historical developments, um, emphasizing one aspect or another. So we're going to see that now as the book of Revelation ends, because many individuals don't understand. And if you read the book of Revelation, I mean, I just told you a big portion of it that is right there implicitly, very open, I mean, explicit, very open, that you have the second coming of Christ in <laughs> Revelation chapter 6. Um, you can't have all these other th things happening after that. It's rewinding human history and going through it again with more details, focusing on different aspects of human history. And as the book of Revelation closes, it does the exact same thing. We will see that. And of course, Panorama, um, once you see this version and then this version and then this version, the book of Revelation now pulls back and combines all of them into one big epic imagery um, that gives you the panorama of all of the, the events that have happened. We'll see that as we close this coming weekend when we look at the seven last seals. Uh, we must remember that Revelation is presenting to the Apostle John historical events that have multiple things happening simultaneously. Thus, Revelation uses replay, narrating one event taking place, then rewinding the view and focusing on another that had been taking place simultaneously. So we left off from our first uh, study tonight, um, unpacking that simple statement that Jesus says that there will be two resurrections, individuals that would experience the resurrection of life and individuals that will be experiencing the resurrection of condemnation. Condemnation. Um, We've also learned that the Bible taught us that there is this other experience called the second death, and by implication, there's also the first death. And Ecclesiastes chapter 9 told us that the first death is experienced by how many humans? Every human. It is not an indictment of judgment, of evil, or good, or nothing. It's just, it happens because of sin. Our bodies wear off, and we just die. So, we have the first resurrection, the resurrection of condemnation, and the second death, we learned that individuals, the cowardly, the idolaters, the, the, the just evil people, the rebellious people, they will be cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says that that experience of being destroyed by the lake of fire, it is described as the second death. So a little recap of the things that we've been uh, going over as we enter into this uh, final presentation so that we can put all of these details together. Revelation 20 verse 3 says, And he cast him, Satan, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little bit, for a little while. I hope you're visualizing this. I hope you may be taking notes, scribbling, doodling. First death, first resurrection. Second resurrection of condemnation, second death. That is the chronology, the big chronology of these events. The first death happens to everyone. Not everyone, though. At the second coming of Jesus, there will be faithful, righteous who, uh, beings that will never taste death. They will go straight into heaven, never having to had that experience. But there will be a large millions that will be resurrected in the first resurrection. Um, the Bible says that the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were ended. So... Jesus' second coming marks the beginning of these thousand years and the resurrection of the wicked for the resurrection of condemnation um, marked the ending of that thousand year period. Um, what will be the righteous people doing in heaven according to the first presentation? They are judging from the books that we learned on, on the night that we studied about the book of life. They'll be going through the lives of those individuals that have resisted and rejected the grace of God and are eternally lost. And at the end of that thousand year period, as the books are closed, the saints are going to say, uh, righteous and judge, uh, just are your judgments, O God. You are merciful and compassionate. And we understand that everyone that is lost is lost of their own doing, of their own choosing. So if all the saved are in heaven and all the dead are dead, how many humans are left on planet Earth? There's no humans left on planet Earth, according to the Bible. And the Bible says that Satan um, cannot deceive the nations no more until a thousand years are finished. Why is that an obvious statement? He cannot deceive the nations because all the wicked nations are dead. 
And that's why he cannot deceive. It's not because all of a sudden he's become honest. It's because he's, there's just no one to deceive anymore. And during these thousand years, Satan will see what his rebellion has produced. And all the angels that have rebelled with him. But you would think that an individual like him, what well, an individual, after a thousand years of looking at the chaos and suffering and destruction, would have some sort of remorse. But that's not how sin works. Once I allow sin to completely and permanently d distort my capacity to think and reason logically, my character becomes deformed in a permanent, irreversible way. And so Lucifer, that covering cherub, during these thousand years, he will have one regret and one regret only, that he couldn't take more people with him, that he couldn't take you, that he couldn't take you. He reads this book just like you and I. He knows this is his destiny. And so he, with great desperation, he is trying to terminate people's lives while they are still in a lost condition. That's why Paul and Jesus and many other Bible writers, when they would urge repentance, when they would urge a return back to the Lord, they wouldn't say, return back to the Lord when it's convenient for you. Paul would say, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today, today is the day of salvation. Today, yield your heart to the Lord. And right now, at this moment, I want to yield my heart to the Lord. Lord, make my heart tender and soft, sensitive to your voice, sensitive to your, the voice of your spirit, obedient to your word. I don't want my heart to become like Satan, so totally deformed. I mean, you think, could that really happen? There are individuals in prison that have taken the lives of many individuals in very brutal, violent ways that on the day of their death, they, they, re, they don't recant anything. They are some psychologists, psychiatrists who say, oh, that's patho mental pathology. I would say that's just the, the ultimate manifestation of what sin will do to beings created in the image of God, but deformed and ultimately destroyed by the effects of sin in their mind. That is where salvation comes from. And that's why we need Jesus so much, because Jesus was sent not to save us from hell, to save us from sin. Sin is what will cause humans to end up in hell. Um, we're going to continue. Revelation 25 and 7 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. Now, when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Why is Satan at the end of the millennium able to deceive nations again? Because what resurrection had just taken place? The resurrection of condemnation. Jesus spoke of only two, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of condemnation. And the dead that are not in Christ are resurrected at the end of the millennium. During the millennium, there's no one to tempt or deceive, but as soon as they're resurrected, that's what reveals that Satan has not repented, recanted, or remorse. As soon as they are humans again, and this time these humans don't have something you and I have from the day that we're born the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and minds, trying to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Jesus in John chapter 16 says that the Holy Spirit is convicting the whole world of those three things, Christians and not Christians. Every human by the Spirit of God is being convicted when they steal, when they tell a lie, when they commit adultery, when they do all these things. They feel it. The Holy Spirit is saying, you're doing something wrong. But at the, at the resurrection of condemnation, the Holy Spirit is no longer working in the hearts of any human being. They have spent their, their entire life rejecting and resisting the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now there is no more presence trying to convict people of sin. That's why this is the resurrection of condemnation. The experience Jesus says, whatsoever a man sows, that which is what he will also reap. God cannot be mocked. 
Today is the day where I need to repent and make peace with my Lord. Today is when the Holy Spirit, as he convicts me of the things that need to be confessed, today is the day that I confess them and I don't put them off. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for us. And whenever I die, I have my destiny divided into two opportunities. Well, one opportunity, one destiny God does not want you and I to experience by any means. As soon as the wicked are resurrected, the enemy goes right to work. And now, because there's no restraint, humans are deceived like puppets. And he, and he takes them under his um, bewitching power. He convinces them to do something strange, something that only a deluded individual could believe. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And at that moment, fire came down, came down from heaven and devoured them. This is the second death. And we're getting one view, one continuous, continuous, continuous view of this historical event right at the end of human history in which these humans, these wicked are resurrected and the deceiver is there and he ha somehow convinces them, probably because there's so many of them, saying, look, there's the camp of the saints. And in just a little bit, we will see that it's actually the New Jerusalem. And the Bible says that in the middle of that glorious city is something that both sinners and Satan want. There is something that they, he convinced, if we can just break through those walls, look at us. See, some of us may die, but look at the glorious destiny of, that we will all have. We can take that city. Look at us. There's a tree of life. And if you and I partake of it, we will never die. And they charge the city, deluded and deceived by the arch deceiver. And in that process of deception, are consumed. What is this camp of the saints? Where did that come from? Well, that's why we need recapitulation or replay. Because many people read that and are like, hold up a second, where is this camp of the saints? Where did, that, where did that come from? Well, we have to go back a little bit because what we were reading was about the wicked coming back to life and Satan deceiving them, but something else has happened. So we, now we got to rewind history and God is going to fill in the details. Um, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of where? Out of heaven. And if it's coming down, where is it coming down to? To earth. I, John, saw the, holy, the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her, for her husband. And this New Jerusalem, this new city, has a glorious description. Uh, guess who is inside this holy city? At the second coming of Jesus, all those humans that were taken to heaven for a thousand years, at the end of the thousand years, come down inside the New Jerusalem. That is the camp of the saints. That is where the tree of life and God's people are. And the adversary convinces all these billions of humans that throughout all human history have used their intellect and minds and, and capacities and talents for evil and destruction all of them together think that they can take and conquer the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. It is as the city descends and settles that, I, that John sees a great white throne and him who sat on it in front of whose face the earth and the heaven flowed away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing for God and books were opened. We looked at these verses already and now they should make a lot more sense. Now we understand who are these dead that are standing before God. These are individuals that have experienced which resurrection? The, con the resurrection of condemnation. That's where they're called the dead. That's where their destiny, that's what they have chosen. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in which of the two books? The book of life? No written in their books. This is why the gospel is beautiful. You and I are born and we inherit and we de develop this book that is ours with our name on it. 
And in it are written in detail all our misdeeds, all our selfishness, all our disrespect, our disobedience to our parents, our our mistreatments of our kids, our selfishness, our manipulations, all these horrible things are there written. Until the day I come to Jesus and I confess to him my need of forgiveness and I confess to him my need of his grace. And Jesus says, that book no longer has your name on it. God the Father says, I'm going to put Jesus' name on that book. He has paid for your sins. He has paid for your condemnation. You are no longer condemned. The condemnation I placed upon Christ on the cross releases you from this book. And now I get to put your name in the book of Jesus, the the, the, the book of the Lamb, the book of life that belongs to Christ. And I want my name in that book. And I, by God's grace, is there right now, and so is yours. We don't have to fear this day of the great white judgment. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And we already know that that lake of fire is which death? The second death. The death that there is no more hope, no more return. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from them out of God, out of heaven from God and devoured them. And this event takes place on planet earth. Hell is not some place in the universe where there's just a lot of fire and God somehow throws sinners there. The Bible says that it is when the new Jerusalem descends out of heaven back to earth and Satan deceives the resurrected wicked those that have experienced the resurrection of condemnation, and he deceives them in such a way that they attack the city that fire goes out from God and devours them. The entire planet will be engulfed in a fire that we cannot produce on this planet because this fire consumes humans and spirits. This is a fire that comes from God himself. This is not lava. This is not just a combination of gases and materials. This is a unique fire that has never existed and will never exist until this moment in which God will do what the Bible calls a strange act of destroying for eternity. As these individuals think to charge and think to destroy, this fire from God consumes and burns and destroys not individuals that had hope, but individuals that resisted and rejected and harden themselves beyond the gift of repentance that God desired to give each of them. This is why, before God does this strange act, for a thousand years, he allows himself to be examined by the saint and say, look at how much I've invested in them. See if I did not try my best to save these individuals. So by the time God destroys them, all of us, as we are watching these individuals perish, we are still with the conviction that God I worship is a God of love. Watching this strange act has not changed any nor diminished my belief in his love and care and desire to save sinners. Revelation 20 verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire of brimstone, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And Revelation 20 verse 7 through 9 says, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Which is it? Because if you devour something, that means it's done. And if you're tormenting them forever and ever, what does that mean? This is where a lot of Christians um, demonstrate the influence that pagan mythology and theology has had on us. There is language that needs to be interpreted with the rest of Scripture. And we cannot take a piece of a verse or one verse and then make that something that overrides the many hundreds of other verses that teach otherwise. In Jude verse 7, it shows us how the Bible uses the word eternal. Eternal has different applications in the Bible. Jude, verse 7, it's only one chapter long. Jude, verse 7 says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example of suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. But we know that Sodom and Gomorrah are not burning anymore because they did burn and God was the one that sent the fire, that was not fire that would burn for eternity. The outcome of that fire would be eternal and irreversible. When God would burn these cities, they would never exist again, and they haven't. 
And that's how the Bible uses that word eternal or forever. In fact, the prophet Samuel, when he was little and his mom had made the agreement with God that if she gave a son that she would dedicate him um, from his childhood for the rest of his life, the Bible says that when, when um, Hannah took uh, Samuel to uh, Eli the priest, he served in the house of the Lord forever. Well, that means he would still be there. But clearly Samuel died, the Bible says. So when the Bible says forever, it just means for a, a, a prolonged period of time, and as far as us humans are concerned, until our end has come. And fire that consumes is fire that one day will end. But there's more to this. <clears throat> I want us to think for a second about individuals that the Bible tells us um, never showed any form of repentance. And let's pretend for a second <clears throat> that I'm wrong and that, in fact, people do go to the hot place called hell and are tortured and tormented, as many Christians believe, that the moment they die is the moment God sends them to hell and they experience the suffering and turmoil and, and torture of heaven, of hell, sorry. So in such places, you would have individuals like Cain, Lamech, Ahab, Judas Iscariot, Caiaphas, Hitler, etc. But I'm lumping them all together. There's thousands of years being represented here, which means that at least Cain has been burning for thousands of years already in hell. The Bible says that at the, resurre- at the second coming of Jesus initiates a time period of a thousand years. So that's a thousand years more that Cain and Lamech and Ahab have been burning and Judas Iscariot. For, a th- for thousands of years, they've been burning and being tortured. But the Bible says that Satan is not cast into the lake of fire until after the millennium. What's wrong with that picture? Who is the one that has initiated this whole mess? Who is the one that started the war in heaven? And he is the one that's going to suffer the least? God is going to be punishing humans, those that have been deceived into sin. Yes, they have rejected the grace of God, but God is going to punish them for thousands of years before even the original culprit gets punished. And this is a God of justice? See, these are questions that I invite pastors and believers of all other denominations to take into consideration in regards to the justice of God. I can't just hold on to a doctrine because my mama and papa or my uncle or my family holds on to it because they may be holding on to something that makes the God of heaven a God that has a character worse than Lucifer. Because a God like this, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to speak plainly from here on out. I have friends that have left Christianity because of the misunderstanding of the belief of hell. There are Christians that want to write it off and say there is no hell. Well, the Bible says there is, and I believe there is because we're reading it tonight. There is fire that will consume sinners and and, and Satan. But the Bible does not say that this fire will be burning forever and ever and ever and ever and ever because to punish someone for 90 years and do so for eternity Begs the question if if that is justice because even our court systems with our fallen broken minds can determine that certain crimes merit certain amounts of time in jail or certain punishments. But the God of heaven, the God of infinite wisdom, he would not, cannot for all eternity punish these individuals. Not just because of the justice not just because this would make him a tyrant, but because this would make his word false and God a liar. Last night, I challenged us to ask ourselves, when I think about opposites, am I being consistent? When I think about truth, the opposite would be error or lies. When I think about light, the opposite would be, when I think about life, then death has to look and be the opposite of of life. And the Bible, the the most known verse in the whole Bible uh, is being spray painted in bridges, subways, and written in graffiti in many places all over the world. John chapter 3, verse 16. We can say it out, if you know, know it from memory, say it out loud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have 
everlasting life. In that precious, most known verse of the Bible, you have these two opposite destinies mentioned. Who are the only ones that are offered eternal life? Those that and whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Only that believe, those that believe in Jesus get what gift? Everlasting life. But according to the pagan influence teaching of hell, if you're going to be burning in hell, hell for eons of time and experiencing the pain and agony that that fire is bringing on you, you have to be alive. Because only living people feel, think, and express. And we can't make death and life to be the same experience just in a different place. And if people in hell are going to be experiencing the, the, the torture and the suffering of hell for all eternity, who is giving them the life to continue experiencing that experience of, of misery? Who is keeping those people in hell alive for eternity? Because then there's only one life giver. Then John 3.16 means nothing. Because those in heaven get eternal life and those in hell get eternal life. And the Bible does not teach something like that. The Bible says that if you don't believe in Jesus, you will perish. And perish means you no longer exist. And there will be a punishment, but the punishment will be meted according to what you have done. It will not be arbitrary, and it will not be carried on forever and ever. Some, the Bible says, will receive many stripes and some few. Only a God of infinite justice would know what and how much. But all of them, including Satan, would come to an end. I heard one pastor say it many years ago, but I've never forgotten. Many Christians believe in a hell that's not hot enough. But the God of the Bible has a hell that's hot enough that it will destroy sin and sinners. And there will come a time in this universe where sin will no longer exist. Because sin needs a host to be in existence. And if God is going to have an eternal hell, we're going to have eternal sin in the universe. And Jesus, God did not send his son Jesus to immortalize sin. He came his son Jesus to save us from sin and destroy it at the cross. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Now all of these verses really should begin to make so much more sense. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13 says, Both the earth and the works that are in it will be what? Burnt up. Not burned forever. Burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on what? On fire. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not experience that fire that will lead and destroy and make it as if you've never existed at all. God made you for eternity. And God sent his son to save each of us. May the grace of God make us participant of that great blessing. This is the great tragedy of hell. Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for who? The devil and his angels. Hell was never meant for humanity. 
had every human that ever existed chosen to have faith in God in the sacrifice of that lamb and confess their sins and live in submission and surrender and yielding their hearts to the voice of the Holy Spirit and every human being accepted the gospel, the only one that would have been thrown into that lake of fire would have been whom? Satan and his angels because God had made and has made ample provision for every human being on planet earth to be saved even today. There is no reason as to why even one human being would perish because God was earnestly striving to save every single one of us. What a God we serve. Jesus never even hinted that hell, this experience of destruction, of final eradication, any human being should have been a partaker of it. It was only for that arch rebel and those that followed his deceptions. Fire with eternal results. The fire God will send at the end of the millennium will consume the unbelievers until they are no more. Satan and sinners will be destroyed forever, making God just and the justifier. And God being just in that he is not punishing eternally, immortalizing sin. It will be destroyed completely. Revelation 21.1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And I heard it. There's a group of us praying. And I spoke with some of the individuals that we've been praying for each of you every morning. Right now, they want to be in heaven. But some of these individuals that I spoke to are parents. And they know that if their child was not there, they would be shedding a lot of tears. There will come a time where God will wipe away those tears. But why the need to be tears? Why not have the whole family there? So if you're a husband that is dilly-dallying with sin, why not repent today and confess, make peace with your God and receive his grace? If you're a wife that right now is very worldly-minded like the wife of Lot, heaven is inviting you today to surrender your pride and vanity and all the things that keep you attached to this world. Surrender it. That's what Peter says. What kind of conduct ought we live knowing that all these things will become ashes? And if you're a son or a daughter, resisting or rebellious, indifferent or uncaring about spiritual things, why have the family separated when you can have your family united for all eternity, never having to say goodbye? God wants to save your whole family. Will you say yes to him tonight? There's an experience that is new in every way. New bodies, new minds, new environments, no pollution, no decay, no death. is unimaginable for us an ecosystem without the cycle of death, but God promises that he can make an ecosystem in which there's no need for death ever and where there are no cemeteries. There will not be no emergency room in the New Jerusalem. There will not be any of the things we are so accustomed on this planet. I think it may take centuries for us to adjust to an environment of holiness and righteousness in which sin and death no longer are part of the experience. What a glorious, glorious experience God has prepared for each of us. What could convince me to miss out on that? You have an enemy. And your enemy will want you to not be united with your spouse in prayer or reading scripture. Why allow for that? The enemy will keep you so busy that you will not have to gather your time to gather your children around or your grandchildren around and pray with them and teach them about this Jesus and lead them to believe in this Jesus that if your children and grandchildren believe in him, they will not perish but have everlasting life. Tonight, heaven is inviting us to commit our lives to pursuing that which no one can take from us, the gift that God offers us in his son, Jesus Christ. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, because these words, they are true and they are faithful. 
who tonight wants to say, I believe what the Bible teaches. God is just, but God is also love. I believe in a God that deserves and is worthy of my worship. God will destroy sin, sinners, and Satan with a fire powerful enough that will destroy them all for all eternity. Evil will never exist in the universe again. Praise God for that. I want to live in the new Jerusalem with all the faithful. So today, I want God's power in my life that I may live a godly life and honor God, his holy name, with the kind of life I live. I want to live a life worthy of my Savior. Which means, my friend, it's simple. Tonight, before you turn off your light, do you make this decision that you will bend your knees and pray to this God in heaven that has sent his Son to save you from that which will lead you to perish and destroy sin? And do you choose tonight without the promptings of anyone else but your own conscience in the silence and privacy of your room or whatever place you've been finding in your home to begin opening this book tonight and beginning with any of the Gospels beginning to come to know and learn to love Jesus Christ your Savior anyone tonight want to commit to these two decisions of prayer and reading scripture prioritizing getting to know this Savior and understanding the truth from Scripture. We cannot simply depend on a human being expounding and teaching. Eventually, we have to pursue it ourselves. If you need a Bible, please see me. We'll make a Bible available for you for free. But even if you were to take a Bible home with you tonight, that decision is ultimately yours. I want to pray for us tonight. Father, that day in which newness will surround us in every way, we will have no regrets of the decision we make tonight. As we hold and reach out and hold the hands of those that have passed away and the waves of reality sink in, it's here and none of us will ever go away. And every human there is in love with you and worships you. That experience, Lord, requires a decision. And I pray for my friends' hearts that in the privacy of their hearts, Lord, in the privacy of their thoughts where only you can see, I pray your spirit would lead all of us tonight to say yes. I commit I choose to bend my knees. Tonight, I will spend time talking about the things in my heart. Ask the questions that I have and open your word for the answers. Father, I pray that all of us would make that commitment tonight of prioritizing and investing in securing our relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that none of us need to have the trepidation of that fear of that fire. Tonight, our names are and can be written in the book of life, and we can rest in peace no matter what. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and thank you, Father, for desiring our salvation above all things. Whatever decisions, Father, may have made, been made tonight in the privacy of our hearts, I pray that the power of your Spirit would seal that decision that it can become actions and movements that, Lord, transform into habits, that transform into character. In Jesus' name, amen, Father.